2018. To date, we've heard from Dr. Nijad and Professor Larry from the University of Toronto about robots that can respond to verbal and human behavior cues to assist the elderly and dementia to live more safe and independent lives, as well as AI being used to uh, predict decision-making of the Supreme Court, sometimes surpassing professionals in the field. We've heard from the Scotia Bank's robotics and smart automation groups on how the culture of our financial institutions are rapidly changing to adopt AI-based functionality to improve its operations. This morning, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Alexandra Wong from University of Waterloo to bring the conversation back to the healthcare arena. The rise in artificial intelligence, particularly machine learning and deep learning, has led to considerable interest in its application in clinical decision making. There are a number of operational challenges in widespread adoption of AI in the healthcare sector. Motivated to tackle these challenges, this team is exploring end-to-end -end code design of instrumentation and AI in unison to create AI-powered medical imaging systems that provide new insights into a patient's medical conditions. Dr. Wong is the Canada Research Chair in Artificial Intelligence and Medical Imaging and co-director of the Vision and Image Processing Research Group. is the Associate Professor in the Department of System Design Engineering at the University of Waterloo. He's published extensively with over 450 reverie journal and conference papers, patents. He's received numerous awards, including Engineering Research Excellence Award, Sanford Fleming Teaching Excellence Award, and Early Research Award from the Ministry of Economic Development and Innovation. Um, his title is Improving Medical Imaging and Diagnostics Through AI-Powered Imaging Systems. Welcome, Dr. Wong. Okay, so uh, thank you for inviting me here. I think uh, hopefully you'll uh, get some, a bit of insight from what I'm going to say. So just, uh, can you hear me? Okay, perfect. So a bit of warning ahead of time, this is probably the most unprofessional uh, talk you'll probably hear in a while. So I kind of just, you know, wing it as I go. So just bear with me. So one of my key things, we have a very long title here, I'm not going to regurgitate it, is one of the key things that I'm trying to really explore with my team as well as my collaborators is can an integrative systems design approach allow us to get better clinical insight discovery? Notice I don't bring up the term, let's say, diagnostics, whatever, so on and so forth. Like, what are you talking about, right? So I have a very different mentality in the way we actually try to integrate AI directly into the clinical uh, imaging kind of uh, realm, and I'll talk a bit about that. So I have to do a bit of a shameless plug because I'm also one of the uh, founding members of the uh, Waterloo AI Institute. I know we're in uh, Toronto here, but I figure I'd give this a shot. So if you don't like this, just Ignore what I'm saying right now. So, uh, just like a bit of context. So, uh, Waterloo AI Institute was recently launched in uh, April 6, uh, and we're quite happy about it. And so, it's largely focused. One of our key distinctions is we're focused on making AI a reality for anyone, anywhere, anytime. I know a lot of times when you're thinking, you know, AI institutes, it's more on the academic realm where it's more like theoretical AI, so on and so forth. Uh, this is a bit less flashy. We're about trying to make it work for people. And so we have around uh, 100 uh, different faculty members working from foundational artificial intelligence. So the theoretical side, we do do like academic work, but we also do a lot of operational AI. So that's not really just applied AI. What we're trying to do is not just take AI and apply it to whatever domain, right? That's where the huge number of startups coming out are doing. So what we're trying to do is look at the operational challenges right, from the fundamental level associated with what's preventing a lot of this powerful, let's say, machine learning, artificial intelligence, deep learning, all the catchphrases from being actually adopted on a wide variety of different verticals, including in the medical realm. And the key thing is that we work very closely with industry as well as clinical institutes to address the fundamental as well, the foundational as well as the operational challenges for highest impact on society. Right? So one of the key things is we're not on some kind of you know, high horse and saying, you know, this is beneath us because there's no theoretical underpinnings. Getting it integrated into society becomes actually a very important part of our mission. So uh, please work with us. <laughs> right? So just a bit about myself. Uh, so uh, 
I guess I could give a really great, uh, I guess, a description. So now what I'm going to do is just tell a little bit more detail. So right now in my research team, we have around 25 plus now. Actually, I need to update my slides around 30 uh, different research personnel from research professors, PhDs, as well as very capable undergraduates uh, who actually design a lot of our systems from scratch. And one of my main focuses has been on medical imaging as well as artificial intelligence. That's how I got my title. I worked on these two things. I combined them together and I stuck a CRC in front of it. So I'm just going a little faster because I just want to get to the uh, fun stuff. So, okay. So just a bit of a context, right? Everyone talks about the rise of machine learning. You can't really flip through, you know, even like pop magazines like you know, Economist, Forbes, they talk about machine learning, AI, deep learning all the time with a proper context. So. What we're talking about is that a lot of the advances in artificial intelligence approaches, especially machine learning, has led to massive media attention, right? Public interest and enormous investments at both the government level and corporate level. It's usually easier to get investments at the corporate level. It's actually surprising that there's a lot of governmental support worldwide. In Canada, we have a $1 billion uh, AI initiative. In France, there's a $1 billion initiative. In China, there is many, many zeros kind of uh, initiative. It's just really crazy. And a lot of things is, people, what people see is pretty much what's cool on the surface. So we have things like AlphaGo, you know, beating you know, world uh, reigning champions like Go, DeepStack, AI beating professional players at poker, Deep speech, AI beating people at voice recognition. Quite literally, it's about AI beating people at something, right? So pretty much, you can watch any one of those conferences that they would have, and essentially, the word machine learning comes out. So if I took a shot every time uh, we hear the word machine learning or AI, I would have to come here very often, <laughs> right? But then the question people always ask me, I get this regularly on a daily basis, people coming over, is great, they keep talking about AI, machine learning, deep learning, what on earth do you mean, All right? So I'm just gonna you know, do a really quick, you know, uh, too long didn't read kind of summary. So when we're talking about AI, it's just a larger branch where we're trying to mimic some kind of human, aspect of human connection, uh, uh, sorry. Cognition could be, you know, trying to recognize images better, or trying to recognize, you know, scene understanding, uh, you know, um, understanding what people are saying. That's kind of what we mean. And within that, there's a small bubble that's actually popular right now, which is machine learning. So, in the context of machine learning, it's about great. In a lot of traditional AI algorithms, we need to come up with rules, very heuristic rules. You know, this is this because of A, B, C, and D. Right? But there are a lot of problems that are just too complex for that, and we just don't know all the rules. So with machine learning, this allows us to take data, and we could train a machine to discover these rules. We might not completely understand what they are, but it's able to derive these directly from the data. So it makes it very powerful for very complex uh, problems, including the ones in uh, medical imaging. And of course, now within that smaller bubble, there's a much smaller bubble called deep learning. And when people talk of deep learning, they usually just refer to deep neural networks. So these are essentially graph-based type of uh, machine learning models where it kind of mimics uh, what a brain does, but not really. But it sounds much cooler when you say it. So then the question that people ask is, okay, why now? Why is somebody getting all this attention? Why do you care? What changed? Nothing much really has changed on the AI side. A lot has changed on the big data side as well as massive computing power side, right? So now we actually have data stored in a digital form. We have annotations and records stored in digital form. Now we can actually take all this information and parse it through machine learning, AI, so on and so forth to get new insights from it. That's what's changed, right? We now have massive amounts of data that we could actually analyze. Before, we had no data, so we're guessing what the rules are. If we have this much data, maybe we actually derive rules directly from the data. And the other key thing is massive computing power, and that's something that a lot of people like Intel as well as NVIDIA are really emphasizing because that's how they make their money. So for those who actually, who here has a NVIDIA stock? Yes. yes. So I wish I, I wish I had that years back because even in the last year their stock went up by 161 percent, and their CEO was named Business Person of the Year. 
right? Before they were the video graphics card company. Now they are the AI company. Right? So now because everyone sees all this power in uh, you know, AI, now they're trying to revolutionize every single field that they have. Right? One of which they're trying to do is medical imaging. Right? In particular, deep learning has been said to going to lead to a modern revolution in artificial intelligence for medical imaging. Right? So uh, despite my title, I'll believe it when I see it. So numerous number of medical imaging company, AI companies are promising to revolutionize healthcare, and some of them recently had FDA approval. So there's Zebra Medical uh, Vision from uh, Israel. They're trying to do pretty much radiology uh, using AI. We have Athelis, which is trying to build a blood test system using AI. We have Arterius, which is one of the first ones to actually get FDA approval. So cardiology using AI. Then we have Imagia in Montreal. We have IBM Watson Health, where they're trying to do treatment prediction, care management, drug discovery, blah, 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 blah. They're trying to do everything for healthcare using AI, All right? But then the big question is, uh, is focusing on just predictive AI enough for enabling widespread healthcare adoption? A lot of their mentalities, which I may not quite share exactly, is I am going to build a system that will tell pretty much doctors what to do. So I'm pretty sure a lot of you might not really quite appreciate that mentality. And it might not, and as you've seen recent news, uh, some of these companies might not be doing as well as they're right now because they're taking a very hard and complex problem and they are, I'm going to use this verb, machine learning it away. It really doesn't go away that way. So I'll kind of talk about some of the operational challenges to better integrate and leverage AI, not necessarily for just predictive diagnostic purposes, but for clinical insight discovery. So a person can learn more from a system and learn more from the data when machine learning, AI, deep learning is used to kind of transform data into knowledge that you can leverage to make a better decision. So that's kind of the mentality you should take. If I said... Okay, so there's a lot of very enormous challenges to predictive AI only strategy for widespread healthcare adoption. So it's not all just sunshine and rainbows everywhere, right? So some of the key challenges that we're trying to tackle, uh, you know, in my research group as well as our collaborators like Farzad over there, I'll keep naming you every so often because I work very closely with Farzad, uh, is the problem of uniqueness explainability, as well as scalability, which I think are key to enable operational AI within a healthcare realm, especially for the realm of clinical imaging. Right? The first thing is what I call a uniqueness challenge. And so in general, machine learning, especially deep learning, is a data-hungry beast, kind of like my kids, and they need to be fed a nice diet of data, right? or else it's garbage in, garbage out. Right? You give it garbage, not, you're not going to get any useful information. And it's not just about quantity. A lot of people purely focus on the quantity part. Right? We have you know, big data. Right? So we could have big useless data as well. So we want to make sure that we're using the data properly. So it's not just quantity, but also quality. And that's actually the, it's unique data that is the key differentiator to being able to build good machine learning, good deep learning, good AI for the health front peer realm. The second thing is the challenge of explainability, right? So a lot of people, when they look at this, a lot of the criticisms is that machine learning algorithms, especially deep learning, are generally thought of as a black box. So pretty much information goes in, question mark, question mark, question mark, and it makes some kind of prediction. How it does it, people don't really know, right? So a common joke in my field, you probably won't find it funny, I'm going to tell it anyways, I'm going to try it, is uh, they ask a deep neural network, why did a chicken cross the road? The deep neural network said it crossed the road, but heck if I know what it did, why? So it's not funny, but I, I thought I'd give it a shot. Okay. So pretty much, imagine you have a black box just tells you an answer. Can you really trust it? You know the decision, but you don't know why it made that particular decision. So especially in 
situations where you're trying to make decisions that actually impact lives, right? You kind of want to at least get a sense as to why the machine is thinking a certain way. You don't need a clear, complete answer, but at least some kind of clinical insight helps you make a better judgment, right? You can't really just trust the black box. And so with a lot of the way people are actually building a lot of these albums, they always do either guilty uh, myself of some of that earlier on, I don't quite believe in that mentality anymore, is like, you'll just say, you know, yeah, it is, or it's not. Why? You just have to trust us. That's a lot of literature that is kind of like that. So the last one is scalability, right? So you'll see a lot of people talk about, oh, great, you know, Google just made this, uh, you know, new AI that, you know, this new deep neural network that just beat people at, let's say, uh, you know, recognizing, you know, 30 different breeds of dogs. Like, I agree. They're way better than me at doing that. But it took them a huge team of PhDs to do it, dedicated on that one thing. The reason for this is it's very, very complex to build a deep neural network properly. People think, who's watched those uh, Watson commercials where they have celebrities talk to uh, Watson in a very conversational manner and it magically comes up with a decision or a solution for you? It doesn't really work that way. Uh, behind that box is a bunch of people actually coding away, trying to create a solution, <laughs> right? So it's very complex to build, right? And great, imagine now you build it, you spend all this effort building it, trial and error, okay, great, accuracy went up by this much, I tuned a bunch of hyperparameters, and I magically had a random seed that created one particular network that works, so therefore I'm gonna keep with it, right? So even you build it, most of them are so large that they're in practical run in a large number of real-world clinical scenarios, right? You can't really just leverage a cloud nonstop, right? You have these large solutions that are intractable to run locally. Great. Now suppose I could afford the cloud, right? I have access to it. Well, cloud computing is often quite reliable. Does anyone remember the AWS crash, right? Most people don't remember as the AWS crash. Uh, they remember it as when productivity around the world increased because no one can play their mobile games, <laughs> right? So it can get quite unreliable, right? We always have security issues that we need to deal with, especially when you're dealing with patient privacy. You're not going to continuously stream raw data back and forth, right, without worrying about checks and balances, right? There's quite a few things that you want to do on-premise locally, right? And great, now assume that you're able to build it you're able to get it to run in a trackable manner, and you have a perfectly reliable cloud, right? Perfectly secure. Won't happen, but let's just pretend. Now, cloud computing cost for deep learning is quite high. It makes it almost impossible to scale for a lot of people. I've worked with a lot of industrial partners where they have a simple system and say, oh, great, okay, how much does it cost? Well, we only do it for one site because it's costing us six figures a month, right? Just to run it, right? So there's a huge number of scalability headaches associated with that that needs to be resolved. So these are the key three kind of problems that we're trying to resolve and we're trying to solve. Or at least the key word is try. Okay. So that's where I guess the notion of integrated AI powered uh, medical imaging systems really come in, in our ability to tackle each of these particular problems. So first thing we're going to talk about is the uniqueness problem, how we've been trying to address it. So what we've done is we're, tr we're trying to do hardware software co-design for the optimal fusion of AI with instrument for enhanced clinical insight discovery, right? So the sentence contains a, quite a few things that we're trying to do. First thing is hardware software co-design. One of the reasons we went to that direction is usually there are really two camps right there. There's the instrumentation people, and there's the software people. The uh, instrumentation people usually solve the problems by building larger, more complex systems with more moving parts, requiring special cooling and technicians to run. So that might be good for a toy case, but it might not necessarily scale properly in a real world clinical environment, right? So that's one way to solve the problem. Another way is to just software it away, which is give me whatever data I may not have domain knowledge on any of it, and I am going to use software magic to give you the proper results. Again, going back to mentality, garbage in, garbage out. 
unless you have proper notions of what's going on from a domain perspective, a lot of these algorithms don't really work well. And when they do work, and when they fail, you have no idea why, right? So what we try to do is try to do an integrative uh, approach where we're trying to design both or optimize both in a end-to-end -end kind of fashion. So we take everything from acquisition, like you know, medical physics, all the way to clinical decision support, right? So that way we can actually build something that is optimal from end-to-end -end pipeline. So I'm just gonna give some examples of what we've done. Uh, and in towards that kind of goal. So one of the key things that we did was uh, work on something called correlate diffusion imaging, uh, which uh, I worked a lot. Again, Farzad, every time I mention your name, we'll have to take a shot. <laughs> so that's something we've been working very closely for quite a long time, is we were trying to create a new form of MRI specifically for uh, detecting hard-to-find tumors. So we're very familiar with the usual, you know, T1, T2, TMSR, blah, 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 PD, like so many acronyms I cannot even remember, right? And in many of these cases, they're great at general uh, tissue uh, differentiation, but what we're trying to do is can we actually be a bit more targeted so we can actually complement the existing modalities that we already have to provide additional uniqueness to it. So uh, one example here is, uh, here is uh, a case of a prostate MRI, right? And so on the left is your standard T2. Uh, there is a whopping malignant tumor on the top, on the right side uh, or left, depending on the usual radiology side. <laughs> Anyways, and you can't really see it there. So imagine feeding that into an AI system, machine learning, and trying to learn from that. If you can't see it and it's not really in the data, it's really not going to learn anything meaningful. And so on the right is something we're working with uh, Farzad on is this is what the type of images you get from a correlate diffusion imaging system. So you don't really need AI to kind of tell you where it is. And this has been confirmed. And that alone is not particularly useful. So you can detect it. But suppose you're trying to do, let's say, focal therapies. You know, just having a bright spot doesn't really help you too much. So when you take what's on the left and what's on the right and you combine it, this gives you a much more powerful clinical insight for how to actually not just detect it, but potentially treat it. Right? So it's all about getting unique information to complement our existing knowledge base. So uh, here's another one. Uh, it's called uh, ADA, so AI Dermatology Assistant that we built. So here we've actually designed everything from an end-to-end -end, uh, perspective, all the way from the imaging apparatus down to the artificial intelligence powering the system. So right now in a lot of, uh, are there any derms here? Okay, good, I don't want to offend anyone. <laughs> uh, so it, it's not really their problem. It's just the limited tools that they have. So right now they either just stare at the surface of the skin or they use a dermatoscope that allows them to stare a bit better. Right, but because they just really don't have access to what's on their knee, right? So then, otherwise, you go directly to biopsy, and you can't just do that. We all know that. So here, what we're doing is we're building an integrated uh, deep tissue scanning system that is not only just the instrument itself, but leverages a large AI component that allows you to grab back the uh, molecular information beneath the surface. So we actually get a full 3D stack of molecular information from which, in which case, we can show that to a clinical, uh, clinician, a dermatologist, and they could actually make much better, more insightful decisions. And so uh, a lot of people who are getting in the dermatology realm, especially dermatology AI, are just telling derms what to do, what the decision is. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, backlash or uh, kind of resistance. Uh, when we show that this to a derm, we actually have a, quite a few uh, derms who came to us, actually called us to actually try it out because it's just about getting more information that they can make the final decision. We don't think or pretend that we can do that. And so right now this has been quite successful. We have a cart-based system, we have a portable suitcase system, and uh, we've also uh, spun off a startup called Elucid Labs around it which uh, won, uh, well, was one of the top 20 uh, most innovative technology companies uh, last year. So we're quite happy about that because it's about taking what we do and bringing it into a realm that people can use it for good. Can you develop an app? 
Pardon? Yes, a lot of people always ask them, why don't I just build an app? So if I built an app, what's going to happen is now it's going to, a lot of people have done that. They're using uh, pretty much the smartphones. And so now you're essentially back to the same stage where we're just staring at the surface. Yeah. So that's something we're trying to get past with this. And we're trying to let people know because nowadays we're a very smartphone-driven society. Uh, it seems everybody thinks everything can be solved with an app. And that's the kind of mentality that I was, I'm trying to emphasize. It doesn't quite work. You really need to have a bit of domain knowledge into your system. Yeah, what's the scanning technology you use? Infrared, ultrasound? So uh, it's an optical-based system. So we use a, more of a multispectral kind of approach to it. Excuse me. Could yeah. you elaborate on uh, why an app? Because if an app is used by a specialist, then it's still adding knowledge to the dermatologist, just like uh, the system you're showing. Oh, yes. No, I know exactly what you mean. So what I mean is a lot of people are actually, uh, a lot of uh, companies are building just apps, right? And they're using a the built-in camera, and they're imaging. So the amount of information that you get back, it's still on the surface level. So that's what I mean by apps. So... On the site, we are building our own app, but it's tethered to our instrument, mm -hmm. so it allows you to get more molecular insights into the situation. So nothing against apps. It's when people just use apps and their smartphone cameras and think it would be better than a terminologist. The answer is not really, and people have done tests on that. Okay. So here's another thing that we kind of built for uh, AI-powered, uh, in this case, for pathology. So uh, any pathologists here? Uh, is it just all radiologists here? Radiation oncology. Oh, radiation oncology. Okay, perfect. Okay, so oh, there you go. We have uh, one person. Okay, but I'm, I'm sure you guys really appreciate your uh, pathologist colleagues, right? So perfect. So I could talk a bit about that. So we all know what a pathologist uses, like the whole slide scanners and so on and so forth. They're quite massive. They're quite expensive. They're quarter half million dollars. As a researcher, I have nothing close to that kind of money. So we had to look for another solution. So what we did was we tried to build our own instrument. So this might not look like much, but it's actually the world's most powerful light field 4D microscope. And the key defining factor about it is there is no there are no lenses or optical components outside of the light source. Right, So that really just stemmed from the fact I cannot afford anything. So where am I going to get money for lenses or moving parts? And so what we did was we tried to think a bit outside of the box. Right, Those are the most expensive components. They're also the most fragile, breakable components. So what if we actually replace them all with computational lenses and computational stages and moving parts? Right, So that allowed us to do a lot. One of which is I could have millions of lenses and it doesn't cost me a dime except for a cheap computer. Uh, the other key thing is I can move them around however I want. It's not going to fall apart. And the last thing is I can actually build lenses that are impossible to manufacture because it's just math, right? Math is cheap. Right? It's good because it's cheap. So this allowed us to build a system that is under $1,000, right? That's just when I say it's from a research-grade system. It's $1,000. Uh, that, it's really not that big. It fits on the palm of my hand. And so we are... We can enable for, let's say, uh, off-site, you know, sorry, on-site kind of uh, imaging in places where you can't just carry that thing around, right? So we have a lot of uh, interest uh, involved, that, especially for places where it's remote or if it breaks, this thing is like Lego. You can just put it back together. And the other key thing that we actually gain from this is uh, because we don't have the optics involved, we're not as limited by the fundamental trade-off between magnification and field of view. So usually your field of view, as you increase magnification, it gets smaller and smaller. You get more and more detail, which is great, but it gets smaller and smaller. Here, I don't have actual a physical lens, so I could get a two orders of magnitude larger field of view, so you don't really have to scan as much. You could get it all in one shot. And the other key thing is that it captures the light field and so what that allows us to do is get full 3D at once. So no more X, Y, and Z. At least that's one of our mentality. We're not, it's not perfect. Lots of things to improve. But we're trying to move towards a system that not only does it not really fall apart, it's cheap, you can bring it on site, but captures data in a rapid manner. Because who here has seen like a whole slide images that are stitched together? 
the stitching isn't really that great. You have a lot of intensity, kind of uh, inhomogeneities, so on and so forth, minor alignment issues. Here, when you just do it in one scan, it's better. And uh, this also gives you, for free, a, a quantitative phase contrast. Right? So for things that are transparent or translucent, you can actually see you know, changes in optical path thickness. So, uh, oh, okay, it's all good. So uh, on, on the right is an example of that. That doesn't really show up too well here, but it, it's all good. So here's an example of a uh, path slide. So uh, the smaller square is a 40x microscope, so you need to do quite a lot of scanning. Uh, this is the whole uh, field of view we could capture, so it's uh, more than 100 times larger. The other key thing is that I'm literally just rendering this particular slice because I get all 3D at once right, in my capture. So I was actually quite proud of the algorithm behind this, uh, mainly because in our very first version, uh, it took around, I'm trying to remember, six hours on a bunch of GPUs. Uh, now it runs in real time on a small mobile CPU, so we're quite happy about that. Prediction or training? Pardon? Prediction or training? No, uh, for uh, image reconstruction. Okay. Yeah, so not even that. I mean, image training is, is cheap yeah. in comparison. Yeah. So are you, you going to show some data that this is... Pardon? Uh, we're, we're, we're looking into it. We're doing, we're working with pathologists hopefully to actually show. So we're also imaging a lot of this also using conventional systems so you could kind of compare. And oh, and the fun part is that recently we've been able to, discuss, uh, I guess, uh, resolve things that are around 300 nanometers. Uh, we're just imaging nanoparticles. So the only way we could verify that was using SEM. So that was actually fun. So another thing that we work on is called coded hemodynamic imaging. This I'll show you a video of. Actually, yeah, I think it's quite fun, uh, which is we're trying to do an AI-powered cardiovascular imaging system. So uh, this got a bit of press, so we're actually quite happy about it. Uh, it was kind of funny. It got press in China. And for my student, they, uh, who is uh, Caucasian, uh, they took his name and they translated it into Chinese. And I'm Chinese, and they used my English name. So that was actually quite interesting. They could have just asked me. <laughs> but anyways, this is uh, the first and right now still the only uh, uh, blood flow imaging system capable of capturing arterial as well as venous flow uh, in a non-invasive manner. You're, everyone's familiar with you know, ECGs, uh, uh, you know, oximeters, so on and so forth. You're getting point measurements. And so uh, one analogy I like to use is it's like trying to measure the uh, traffic condition in Toronto by measuring one particular intersection. We all know things change. When people say pulse, it's different throughout the entire body, what they mean by pulse. And so what we're trying to do is, can we actually measure all these intersections all at once, right? So that's what we've been able to do. In, uh, well, with initial success, we're still building upon it. We're also uh, working with a lot of clinical partners to try, because now it kind of enables you to analyze things in a way that you can't usually do for things like strokes, heart failure, so on and so forth. So for example, for uh, heart failure, uh, usually it's a kind of an operational exploratory kind of thing where you put in a catheter and you jam it into your jugular, right? I don't know what's the proper clinical word for jamming something into your jugular. Uh, so what we, we did was we're the first to show that we're able to actually observe uh, the jugular vein uh, in a non-invasive manner, directly see the blood flow as it moves in a spatial manner. So working with people for things like, you know, like drug treatment, right? So suppose I inject a drug, don't want to wait, I actually want to see it actually as whether it's actually improving conditions. So these are some of the things that uh, doing an AI-powered medical imaging system kind of enables. Okay. And this is something, again, Farsat, let's take a shot. Uh, uh, discovery radiomics. So everyone's heard of, you know, the word radionics thrown around quite a lot. And so that's pretty much a lot of people designing kind of uh, you know, hand uh, biomarkers, all right? So one of the key insights uh, myself as far as that, as well as Dr. Hader came up with, is can we try to discover some of these quantitative uh, imaging biomarkers directly from the images themselves and complement it with existing ones that we are aware of, right? And so we were able to get really good performances just having this kind of approach. Again, at the end of the day, it's a person making decision, but the more information you gather for them, we feel it's a better solution. 
So all those have to do with the whole uniqueness challenge. So how can what we do also enable better explainability? So again, the usual kind of uh, chain of events is uh, people from a, a deep learning perspective, machine learning, they'll take an image, they'll dump it into their magical black box, and then it'll tell them an answer, malignant, benign, right? So what we felt was, well, that really isn't particularly useful because if you tell a radiologist that, they're not gonna trust it. They'll just put it on the uh, usual uh, radiology uh, technology graveyard on the side of their office, uh, amongst uh, other things, and they'll do what they usually do. So what we're trying to do is, can we get additional in clinical insights that they can use to make their decisions? So in our case, what we did was we built something called Clear. And with Clear, what you do is, you, you still dump an image into your magical black box, but it actually tells you what insights led to a particular decision. So even if you don't trust the decision, it might be useful for finding hotspots that you should be focusing on, right? That you should not be ignoring. So in this particular case, here's a, you know, a lung CT case. So what they did was, I'm just actually cropping a particular area so it's easier to see. What they did was they just, let's say we put in a you know, CT slice, right? And we ask the machine, you know, is it malignant, is it benign? It'll give you an answer, right? But we don't really care about that. What we care about is these identifying locations that it found as hotspots. And so what you'll see is that in many of these cases, it's able to reliably kind of identify the location of what you should be paying attention to. These all have been kind of uh, verified. So now we're not telling people what to do. We're trying to guide them to locations that they should look more closely at. So in this particular case, all of these are mal uh, malignant, and it guides you to this particular area where there's a nodule that you should be looking at and tries to pinpoint those. So that kind of gives you some additional insights as to what you might want to focus on, because as radiologists, you know, you have just way too much data to look at, right? So people say, let's improve in machines, let's just feed more data to radiologists. We're human, so at the end of the day, there's only so much data you could absorb and make use of. So in which case, if we could help kind of speed up the process uh, or improve consistency, that's something that would be uh, really great for us. All right? So we also tried it on cases where it's not just kind of like a binary decision. So here is uh, where we use a fundus image uh, to get a particular grade for a diabetic retinopathy. Again, we don't claim that we actually uh, provide a you know the perfect answer. Right? No one can. But what we do is we actually provide insights on where you should look at, as well as all the possible decisions that can be associated with it. Right? So we're not saying it's a particular grade. We're showing what are the key areas to look for associated with every single <coughs> grade that you have over there. So in this case, five different grades, and it'll pinpoint areas associated with those five different grades. So we take a look on the right, it actually, so a lot of uh, regular, you know, healthy vasculature is highlighted in red, so it's perfectly fine. It's, uh, it feels it's uh, not diabetic retinopathy, but there are actually some uh, anomalies as well as irregular types of uh, vasculature that it highlights as moderate DR as well as mild DR. So what you can do is you can kind of look like, well, okay, maybe the machine is finding something that I want to pay a bit of attention to. Right? Again, it's not about the decision itself, but the potential insights that you gain when you have kind of like a system that says, oh yeah, please look here and here and here. You can still look where you usually look, but these might be of interest to you. Right? And the last thing has to do with scalability. So everything we talk about, you know, great, we could build it. You know, everyone's claiming 90 something percent, uh, you know, accuracy. That's good for them. I, I'll, I, I don't quite believe all of it, but uh, you can always get data a certain way. But anyways, so we try to avoid doing that. So even if you build the perfect system, you can't really quite scale it. How do you actually get it so that you could do it on premise directly in, let's say, a radiologist computer or a little box beside it? So what we try to do is how do we actually take this powerful deep learning solutions, deep neural networks, and how do we actually get it in a form that actually can run, right? So it's actually not a trivial problem. So one of the things that we tried to do was we entertained the idea, can deep neural networks evolve naturally into highly efficient yet powerful deep neural networks? 
right? And so that's some of the stuff we do on the evolutionary deep intelligence side, right? Can things evolve? To be a better form. So usually when we talk about evolution, we're talking about you know millions upon millions of years and so on and so forth. Here I'll even just talk, I'm just going to limit the scope just within our lifetime. Everyone, most of the people have actually seen the plot on the right, right? On one of the uh, you know really famous studies, right? In that particular study, they said you know pretty much you've kind of reached your synaptic peak when you're around six to eight months. So after your synaptic peak at six to eight months, when you're a baby, uh, everything's just been pure downhill. Uh, pretty much, it'll keep going downhill until it reaches zero, and that's when you're dead. So, I don't like to tell my kids that they're smarter than me, right? <laughs> at least not at their current age. So, I usually go with the mentality: well, we're we're just we're just getting more efficient, right? <laughs> and so, so instead of you know when you're young, you always say you know you play hard, right? There's a lot of you know young kids here. So we'll play hard, we just brute force through it. When you're older, you say you play smart. That's the kind of mentality that we're trying to take. And from a deep neural network perspective, we actually found it to be quite powerful. So we're able to build deep neural networks that are significantly faster and smaller. In fact, orders of magnitude, we've hit like a 200 times smaller kind of mark uh, one time. It's actually quite good and it still maintains its full uh, capabilities. Right? So just like the human brain, as we go through our lifetime, we might not have as much of you know, synapses or synaptic density, but whatever we have, we're really making great use of it. And so this allows us to uh, put operational deep intelligence directly in the palm of your hand. So not only are you building small devices that you know, allow you to do everything in real time, we're also trying to get on you know, your mobile apps, your, uh, you know, tablets, and so on and so forth. So it adds a bit of, you know, real-time intelligence to it to aid in your decisions. Okay, so just to kind of summarize what I've been talking so far, I kind of ramble a bit, so uh, it's much better to look at it in one slide. So pretty much AI has become more and more integral and crucial part of life. It's something that we really can't avoid, right? I mean, one example, the only reason I really, I got here was because of Google Maps, right? Or else I'd be wandering on the streets right now, right? That's powered by AI, right? So we can't, every, it's, it's, it's an indispensable part of life. You just, we just have to get used to it. However, there are a lot of challenges towards operational artificial intelligence for healthcare, but the rewards can be quite enormous if you do it right. What I feel is that there needs to be a greater focus on empowering operational clinical insight discovery as opposed to just computers just telling you what the final decision is. And so, in general, I've talked to a lot of clinicians who ask me about what people say AI, deep learning, and they're kind of afraid of it. There's really no need to fear AI for healthcare. You should embrace it for augmenting clinical intelligence as well as improving healthcare system, right? I believe people always need to be in the loop. Uh, but if you provide people with better data, then they just do a better job. Cool, and just got to thank the uh, money people. So, <laughs> answer Canada Research Chairs Program. Thank you for money so I can actually do research. Cool, and thank you for listening. Thank you very much for that uh, very insightful talk. Um, welcome, questions, comments from the audience? Uh, for the clear yep. that they were talking about, there's a, a paper that recently came out. It's called Explaining Image Classifiers by Adaptive Dropout and yep. Generative Inferring. Yep. I was wondering if you use that paper because basically it looks it goes through a convolution network to find where it looked at. Is it, no. I wonder if you use that paper in order to... Yes, so uh, not for this. Uh, and there's a number of reasons why. Uh, to do this uh, from a scalability perspective is quite enormous. So uh, in that particular paper, it's kind of like they're doing kind of like an ablation, right? So pretty much, well, get rid of something, how does it influence? Get rid of something, how does it influence? And they'll just keep doing that. For very small toy networks, that's okay. For a publication, that's also okay. But imagine you have, to have a very large network with millions upon millions of parameters looking at the right combinations of that. Because we might be able to, let's say, drop a drop, right? Uh, what... Does that mean that neuron itself has that full influence over the system? It could be a combination of them. 
Now I have millions of them. Now I have millions of the power of millions to actually go through it. So it's not quite uh, tractable for a lot of these particular tasks. Thank you very much. So one of the issues that we have in healthcare is the lack of the ability of systems in different hospitals to talk to each other. Yep. How dependent is AI on what particular system you introduce into your hospital? Is it going to be universal or are we going to be have just as much difficulty accessing data from Sinai as we do current? Yes. So uh, at least uh, for some of this for uh, AI diagnosis, uh, or sorry, for uh, AI clinical insight discovery, that does not help the situation. And actually, it's one of the challenges that we have to face because if you can't, it needs data, it needs good quality data, and ideally, we have it from all the different you know clinical sites. But as you mentioned, that's not the reality. So as even as humans, it's hard to get data from uh, other sites. So, but that's something that really needs to be uh, kind of resolved from a uh, software infrastructure perspective. Uh, versus, it's not something that you AI away. Can I just ask you about, it was a bit worrisome when you said cloud computing and uh, patient privacy is not uh, protectable. So because you know we are obviously moving to where Office 365, we're using yep. OneDrive, where, you know, but there's supposed to be an encrypted box with yes. a folder where we are able to use uh, PHI, personal health yep. information. Of course. So, so are you saying that, it, are you making that statement in that Anything is hackable. Or are you saying that that actually is not as protected as we'd like yes. to think it is? So uh, I'm trying to say it in a very nice way. So, <laughs> so everything is hackable, uh, and things are indeed not as well protected as we hope it would be. But that's just the nature of software. There's always little issues here and there. So one of my uh, mentalities, and also shared by a lot of people from a secure perspective, is because it's just a reality that we have to live with. Like, quite honestly, even if we do things on paper, that's also hackable, right? Uh, there's also, our processes are not perfectly secure, right? When we're shipping you know, data, like documents, back and forth from site to site. One of the key things is how do we actually minimize the risk involved? So what I really mean here is that, for example, there's a lot of patient data that we could analyze locally, and we could then create metadata from it. So one example is, uh, as soon as you create a report, if the uh, report might be, let's say, let's pretend the report is leaked. Right? It's not actually the direct imaging information from the patient. It might be for a particular diagnosis. Right? So at least there's a level of protection. Uh, the other thing is I also work with a lot of healthcare companies for things like monitoring. Right? You know, a lot of times you know, there's not enough nurse practitioners around. Right? Always can use more. But with a bit of additional video analytics, you're able to kind of look for, you know, is the person about to fall? Or is there some, something that we should be aware of and take care of? And so we could, in theory, send everything through the cloud, but there are a huge amount of patient privacy issues when you're sending their raw images back and forth. If we could do a lot of the analytics locally and just say, oh, yeah, there's this anomaly, this person is, this person, you don't actually say who it is, is moving you know, X, Y coordinates here to there, and if that gets in somebody's hands, you can't really associate back to the patient, and it's just metadata that's, Ideally, you protect it, but it's less of an issue. Yeah, I wonder if you can talk about reproducibility. It's something that's important for any yeah. tool. And it sounds like there's a lot of evolution that can happen in this black box. Yep. And would we have to, like, as humans, we have to keep up with this evolution as we use this tool? Or? Yes, the, uh, the answer is uh, to a certain extent. But in terms of reproducibility, what we also do, it's just as scientists, is to keep track of our findings. So uh, we talk about like, like building deep neural networks, right? There's a bunch of different you know, random processes involved. Uh, one of the most popular, the de facto, for example, optimization we use is stochastic gradient descent. That is stochastic in nature. So there's a bit of randomness to it. But uh, as well as a lot of the hyperparameter search, the more efficient ones are also stochastic in nature because you don't want to brute force through it. There's just too many parameters. But if we, for example, keep track of, let's say, the pseudo-random seeds that we use, at least we're able to reproduce the exact same results. So these are things that we should be uh, cognizant about. So I hear what you're 
you're saying that the idea of sort of a black box that spits out a binary, you know, malignant or not, and doesn't tell you why is a, is a problem and is not what we want to go towards. But does it not serve a purpose in, in triaging to some degree? So we say, you know, if something, if AI spits out, yes, this looks like it's a problem that these, you know, gets bumped to the front of a line and, and deals with some of our wait time issues, be it dermatology or radiology or anything like that. And then we bring in the clinical insight to look at the nuance of, of that, but at least to deal yes. with that preliminary problem. Oh, I know exactly what you mean. So with what we're doing here, you get both. That's the key thing. And the reason you get both is, first of all, maybe that's all you need, like for triaging purposes. Uh, and then, but uh, suppose something goes wrong, right? There's also a notion I really didn't talk about, I really should have, is uh, regulatory compliance as well as accountability. If something goes wrong and AI decided, then you probably wanted this uh, kind of a uh, reasoning behind it. And that's kind of, who, who's been getting those emails before for uh, GDPR? Right, like you get your emails, oh, you've been using this service, uh, uh, service and because of GDPR, the General Data Protection Right uh, kind of act in, uh, in European Union, right? Where now they have this additional portion where it's the right to explainability. So anything that is, so again, legally it's still a little shaky, but that's, it's a good mentality. Anything that is uh, determined solely by an algorithmic means, which includes AI, a person has the right to uh, challenge that particular decision. So if you have people challenging and you have no way of addressing that challenge or saying well, these are the reasons why, then it becomes a really big issue. Um, personally, I like your uh, message or thinking that this should enhance the clinical capabilities and, and our current way of assessing problems or making decisions. But is that a little bit also generationally influenced? Uh, uh, you know, the digital natives, the current generation, would they be more likely to accept AI making all the decisions and not trying to have it as a sort of small delta to our current thinking? So that's partly part of the mentality. So I, I do agree with that. But uh, even then, I mean, I know the younger generation is like, well, now I'm saying like the younger generation. So anyways, are more, uh, there you go, <laughs> are, are more accepting of it. Uh, it's still important for the younger generation uh, to not completely rely on AI to make their decisions, right? So it's like, uh, it's like planes, right? Like, because of the amazing control systems they have in place in planes, like once it's in the air, they kind of fly themselves, right? The pilot is just there for checks and balances. But when you need the checks and balances or an emergency that a system cannot handle, you want somebody who's actually capable of flying a plane, right? That's, I, I would say that's the same kind of mentality we should take for pretty much most professions when things don't work as well. Uh, or when things are broken, or machines break as well, a person should be able to come in and actually take care of the situation. So we should not just forget like going to medical school because, <laughs> because AI is doing it. I mean, um, so for the, for the CHI, for AI-powered cardiovascular healthcare yep. part of it, um, this is me assuming, but I, I was wondering how like, you went about doing that. Did you use time series networks and convolution networks like together? So that's what I, oh, I completely forgot to show the video. I'll show the video very soon. But there's no deep learning involved in that. And that's also the other message that I like to get across is there's no one size fits all AI, right? There's a lot of things where completely, you don't need even machine learning SVM. for it, right? So, I mean, I mean, that's all machine learning, right? So there's a lot of other things that you can actually use, right? For example, with a lot of unstructured data, right? People just use uh, boosting approaches, right? Actually do so on and so forth, right? In a lot of kind of problems, you do logistic regression and that's good enough, right? You don't need something that is overkill just because everyone is using it. So what we do in our research group is we do a wide range of what we call different types of AI algorithms. They could be very simple, but if they work well enough within a clinical environment, that's good enough for us. So I just want to show it or else I'll completely forget again. Sometimes people think I'm just making things up. Okay. So just pause it, 
give a little bit of context. And also, I don't like to show like things that are not real. So I don't pretend that I could localize you know, all flow specifically just down to one particular vein. Right? That's just not possible with a lot of these technologies. So here, but we give a rough idea of uh, arterial as well as venous blood flow. So at least you have this new level of information to draw from. So here we actually slowed it down by one-sixth of the speed because otherwise it's just shooting back and forth. It's very hard to see. The other key thing is that it's pseudo-colored. So it's not actually like red and blue. I know the audience here knows about this, but I have uh, other audiences who are like, oh, wow, you're actually seeing blue blood. Like, uh, I'm not going to try to Anyways, so here is pretty much this is somebody's neck, and that's actually a person's lips. And so you'll actually see uh, blood flow from the carotid arteries uh, to, well, it feeds your brain, which is important. So it actually gives us insights about things without actually opening up brain, just by the asymmetries as well as the changes uh, there, and that it perfuses to the uh, capillaries uh, in the face, as well as through the lips, one of the few areas that no pigmentation, and then it comes back through the jugular vein. So important to give context. So that's just an example. We tested, we did a much larger test and it actually does work. We we're actually quite pleased about it because at first we thought it would not work, just like with most research people do. So it's one of those nice, pleasant surprises. And uh, just as a little story, uh, originally we didn't think that we would even see a venous flow through the jugular. And so at first when we were looking at our data, we thought it was an error. It's like, why do we suddenly have this weird phase shift? Well, you know, what goes up must come down. So, and so right now we're still repairing our system because uh, parts take time. They don't magically appear. It's not like Amazon Prime for optics. And so, but uh, we, what we usually do is we invite people. So if you don't believe the videos and you don't believe what we're showing, you can actually come to our lab and we've given people blood flow selfies before. <laughs> so how does this determine congestive heart failure? Pardon? How does oh, uh, it's, we're trying to figure out. So we're working with clinicians because they haven't, one of the key things is that when you haven't seen this kind of information before, uh, you don't really know what to make of it but because they have the knowledge about the cardiovascular system that I clearly do not have close to that kind of knowledge, hopefully they're able to see some additional insights. So for example, there was a case where, we would just go with a simple, let's say blood clots. That's at least easier, at least for me to understand. Uh, so uh, pretty much what we observed was that uh, you'll see that there's actually an acceleration, like a, a faster flow at the blood clot. It's actually trying to shoot around the blood clot. So that was an interesting thing that we saw that I, I personally didn't know. Of course, clinicians would know this, but they haven't actually seen it in this kind of scenario. So this was just by analysis of the surface? Yes, just from the surface. So it, it penetrates the skin uh, to a certain... So we can actually see it, but we can't actually... We can't see the heart. Right now. But with uh, the power of like machine learning AI, we might then be able to infer conditions that are below without having to do it from an uh, operation perspective. So what is this picture actually capturing? What, what is it detecting that shows the, uh, it, it's, uh, the blood flow um, on, the, on the surface that, that I cannot pick up? Oh, uh, that, that's because uh, when you use a different wavelengths of light, uh, not just within the visible realm, we also use a combination of different wavelengths, it has a greater penetration into the skin. So that's the key thing. So on the surface, you can't really see this, but when you're getting information below the skin, coming back, and then we do a decoding process using kind of computational models, AI, and so on and so forth. This allows us to eke that information that you captured below the surface and map it to something that you recognize. So, so is there coloration there showing oxygenation levels? Pardon? Oh, no. Uh, not right now. So uh, we have another case, another video that we have does show uh, oxygen, uh, pretty much uh, oxygenation levels. So pretty much it's like oxygen flow.